Welcome to Strip Cover Lit. I'm Dalton Gentry, and it's Friday, so I am here again for a little bit of a series that we have just started here on Strip Cover Lit. This is How to Read Books Good, episode number three, a breakdown of how to read literature like a professor by Thomas C. Foster. And today, as we have been doing with this series, we are going to be breaking down a full chapter of this novel here, talking about the points uh, that Mr. Foster brings forward here, and maybe tying them together with a little bit of uh, some work strip cover lit's done, uh, just for full continuity, because we like that kind of thing here. Uh, this is going to be a review of Chapter 3, which is entitled, Nice to Eat You, Acts of Vampires. How very fitting as we move forward with a new series very soon. Adrian reads Twilight, which may get a little bit of a mention, but we might save that because technically we haven't released it on the channel yet, so maybe we'll put that on the back burner. We'll see how this goes. As always, if you haven't already picked up a copy of How to Read Literature Like a Professor, Thomas Foster, I would highly suggest it. Uh, that is my personal opinion. I wish Thomas Foster was paying me to say that, uh, but it is a great book. It's funny, it's insightful, and you're going to learn a lot from it. And today we are talking about vampires and what vampires in the supernatural mean in the literary world because sometimes when vampires and ghosts and things along that nature are being utilized, uh, the story's not really about vampires and ghosts. And sometimes when they're not being mentioned at all, that is exactly what it's about. So, a lot going on with this chapter here, a great chapter as always. But let's dive right into it here with the first point we need to make. Vampire stories, as well as ghost stories, may not be about vampires and ghosts. Now, Mr. Foster here gives a great example from Shakespeare, and we always talk about Shakespeare here because you can tie everything back to Shakespeare, if that may be a spoiler for something to come. In Hamlet, Hamlet is visits by his father, the ghost of Hamlet's father, and he is not there to do ghostly things. He's there to move the plot forward. He is there to warn him about some uh, things going on in the House of Denmark. I, I hope I got all my references there. It's been a hot minute since I've read Hamlet. Uh, but that is exactly what's happening. The ghost is being used at this point as a uh, mechanism, if you will, to move the plot forward, to uh, deliver information to uh, our protagonist. And we do have an example where this has been utilized in Strip Cover Lit's uh, realm of things here. A great book by Shirley Jackson, The House on Haunted Hill, or The Haunting of Hill House, or whatever the hell else it's been published under. We get this example. Now, the book itself is about the alleged haunting of Hill House and the supernatural forces and ghosts that may be within the home themselves. But these ghosts and forces never actually uh, materialize, if you will. However, as we brought up quite a bit in our review, this seems to be more focused on the mental stability of the main character, Eleanor. And at the end, we are led to believe, is this even a haunting of Hill House, or is this an internal haunting of Eleanor, which may not be supernatural at all, but may just be something within her that... Uh, maybe pushing towards a little bit of a mental instability here. Now, the ghosts are appearing throughout this novel here. I did say earlier they never actually materialize, but we are led to believe at the end whether those things were actually there or not, because many of them revolve around Eleanor's perception of things. So in this story here, which is about the supernatural, it may not actually be about the supernatural. We may be talking here about some mental health issues going on with the main character. Now, there are other sides of this story as well. When we get a novel where vampires, the supernatural, are not mentioned at all, but it really comes down to the fact that it's all about vampires. So I'd like to read you a little bit of a schmeckling here from page 19 of How to Read Literature Like a Professor. But you don't need fangs and a cape to be a vampire. The essentials of the vampire story, as we discussed earlier, an older figure representing a corrupt outworn value, a young, preferably virginal female, a stripping away of her youth, energy, virtue, however you want to put that, a continuance of the life force of the old male, the death and the destruction of the young woman. These are the quintessential things to a vampire story. And everyone's familiar with uh, Dracula, Bram Stoker's Dracula. But let's be honest, has many people actually read Dracula? Probably not. But we all know how it works here. And we all know that Dracula is often portrayed as an older, uh, suave, hypersexualized man. 
and he preys upon younger, uh, unmarried women at this point in time in Victorian literature that would most likely allude to virginal women. And what does he do? He takes their essence. He takes their life force. And uh, it, in a point in time where uh, the virginity of a woman was greatly valued as a uh, social construct, how did, I don't believe how Foster put this here. He's basically taking away her marriageability uh, from young suitors. Uh, from here, a nasty old man, attractive but evil, violates young women, leaves his mark on them, steals their innocence, and coincidentally their usefulness, if you think marriageability, you'll be about right, to young men, and leaves them helpless followers in his sin. So we're getting the idea here, the stereotypes of vampire fiction, what that will mean, but oftentimes we get that when there's no vampires at all. One major review that we did here on Strip Cover Lit, which was a gorgeous book that I would highly, highly suggest... Uh, I, I cannot praise this book enough by just how phenomenal the writing is, would be Vladimir Nabokov's Lolita. Now, this is clearly not a vampire story. We have no fangs in this novel. We have no vampires. But we do have Humbert Humbert in this. And Humbert Humbert is an older man who is preying upon the young Dolores. And what does Humbert Humbert do? He sexualizes poor young Dolores and preys upon her and through that, his narrative lives on while she is forever ruined. Uh, it just uh, ruined as a person. Uh, this is vampire fiction at its finest here. Uh, we are getting all the tropes of vampire fiction being applied to a non-supernatural world. And Nabokov is a master of the written word. Uh, this is a, a terrible story. Uh, this is an awful story. This is about the uh, molestation of a child. However, uh, Nabokov's writing is just so gorgeous that throughout this, you start to identify with Humbert Humbert uh, as he tries to you know, speak through this and try to justify his means. Uh, and, and it's disturbing uh, how romantic of notions Nabokov is capable of writing in such a terrible scenario. But... Back on the vampire train here. Uh, this is vampire fiction at its finest. We are getting the older male gentleman. We are getting the younger virginal female. We are getting all the tropes here with none of the fangs. So what the big point that Foster is trying to bring forward with this is oftentimes in literature, when you're seeing things like this, you can tie it together and get a better understanding of what's going on. Now, in Twilight, things have been thrown kind of on their head. Uh, there's been a recent major boom in the vampire genre, if you will. Vampire fiction's become an extremely popular thing. And at a period in time, uh, in its infancy, Victorian literature with Stoker's Dracula, vampires were often used as a mechanism to address sex and sexuality. It's, we're getting back to this again. Uh, you couldn't talk about that. That's a taboo subject in Victorian life. However, if we create a monster, a mythological creature that feasts upon the living, and maybe just make him a little attractive, and maybe just give him a little bit of a sexual flair to him, that's fine. We can get away with that. But that's not something you can actually write about. So it had to be hidden in there. It had to be hidden under that guise of vampire fiction in the Victorian literature era. We've kind of thrown that out the red, out the window right now. You can write a book literally about whatever the hell you want, uh, and people are probably going to buy it. That's how the book world works today. So in Twilight, we get something slightly different. Uh, this is a younger vampire. However, is he younger? How long has he been 17? That's one of the first questions Bella asks Edward, because in reality, though he gives the appearance of a young man, he's just an old creep again. And what's he doing? He's lusting after the young woman. And what does he want to do to young woman? Obviously penetrate her with his fangs and feast upon her energy and essence. So again, we are full circle, vampire literature at its finest. And that is another thing that came forward from the Victorian area of literature, and this is where we always give our lovely little Freud cards to. Oftentimes in literature, the choice of the writer to select certain words uh, might be alluding us to think something else. The idea of how does a vampire feed, how does a vampire gain essence from a human, it's through penetration. Those fangs are going to sink very deep into your skin, and that is obviously a sexual metaphor if I've ever seen one. That is a Freud card right there. And again, it all comes back to Victorian literature and 
How can we talk about this? How can we write that hit novel that everybody wants to read when there's a lot of tab taboo subjects that we can't speak about? So, quick little snippet here from How to Read Literature Like a Professor, Chapter 3, uh, dealing a lot with vampires and vampire fiction. Uh, the big bolded quote in this here, and I, I love Thomas Foster for this because he always bolds the highlights in each chapter, uh, simple as this. Ghosts and vampires are never only about ghosts and vampires. So, take that for what you will there. Hopefully that will improve your reading spectrum just a little bit here. We will be on every Friday with another episode of How to Read Books Good, a chapter breakdown from How to Read Literature Like a Professor by Thomas C. Foster. And next week, chapter four, which I really should have prepared, but why not look at me flipping through here. Uh, chapter four, we will be discussing now... Where have I seen her before? We'll see what that means next Friday here on Strip Cover Lit. And if you want to join us in this little adventure that we're having, make sure you hit the subscribe button down below. Give this video a like as well. We always do appreciate that. And if you want to help us create more great content like this here on Strip Cover Lit, there is a link, as always, to our Patreon to be found in the description below.